With that, I'd actually like, I'd like to ask, I can't talk now. With that, I'd like to ask John Walsh of Accenture to come up. I'll introduce him, and he's going to introduce our first award winner tonight in the category of legendary leader. The spirit of this award, the honoree is, thanks, we couldn't have done it without you. John? Thank you, Jonathan. You know, I'd, after listening to that, I'd like to start by asking all of you to join me in thanking Jonathan and the Churchill Club for putting together programs like this, bringing us all together and to have these conversations. Okay, the Legendary Leader Award. This award is about inspirational leadership in the contributions to others' innovation and success. When the Churchill Club asked its academy to nominate honorees for this award, they asked them to identify people who have seen and envisioned a brand new future. People who frame industry and societal needs and create solutions in a way that are uniquely their own. Of equal importance is the ability to recognize and develop talent and catalyze great teams. We asked for the legendary leader who has had an enormous impact on the industry he or she served and through the contributions of the people that ha they helped along the way. This year's legendary leader is someone who was recently ranked by Forbes magazine as one of the top 10 most innovative leaders in the world. Oprah called him one of the greatest entrepreneurs and CEOs of our time. During his tenure, the company he leads has grown from 338 to over 12,000 employees in 30 offices around the world. Its revenue increased from 78 million to more than 5 billion, this individual successfully oversaw the IPO of his company in 2011, as well as a sale in 2016 for more than $26 billion to Microsoft, where he continues to serve as a CEO today. In addition, he serves, as, serves on a number of boards, including Intuit and EverFi, where he is co-developing a program to help ensure that compassion is taught in every primary school in the US. I couldn't be more pleased to have the privilege of announcing that the 2018 Legendary Leader Award goes to Jeff Wiener, CEO of LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm proud of the longstanding history Accenture has had with LinkedIn, and I, am incredibly, and I am incredibly optimistic about LinkedIn's future with Jeff at the helm. Please welcome Jeff and his conversation partner, Jesse Hempel, head of editorial at Back Channel and senior editor at Wired Magazine. everyone. Thank you for that. That was an incredible introduction. Um, Jeff, from where we sit now in 2018 um, at LinkedIn, two years after Microsoft has acquired you, um, it is a moment of, of recognition of great success. And so I'd like you to actually start by thinking about Jeff at 22. Jeff, who had not yet had a leadership opportunity like Do I have to? Have. You have to. Okay. That's where we're going. What advice would you have for yourself then? So before I answer the question, I, I want to start by thanking the Churchill Club and all the members for this extraordinary award. Uh, it's incredibly humbling, especially when you consider the people that came before me. And uh, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, one, two, I also understand that there's a magical team award. And uh, it's interesting to be given an award for leadership uh, as a soloist because you can't lead unless you have an incredible team behind you. So I guess this just as easily could have been the, the leader of a magical team award. And for that, I want to thank everyone at LinkedIn who really made this possible. Because without them, I wouldn't be here today. So. Uh, the advice I would give my 22-year-old self uh, is to be compassionate. Um, that sounds so simple, yep. Jeff. Like to keep it simple. Yeah. Here's the thing about that word compassionate. Yeah. 
Um, and it's one that you used to talk about leadership a lot. Um, it, it's a big, squirrely word that a lot of people choose to define in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So I want you to explain what you mean by compassionate, and as important, how you got to that definition. So it's not necessarily my own definition. Uh, it, it's really something I learned uh, from a book called The Art of Happiness, which is about the teachings of the Dalai Lama. And in this book, he does this uh, fantastic job of explaining the difference, a really fundamental difference, between compassion and empathy. And all too often, especially in Western society, we have a tendency to use those two words synonymously. But there's a, a key and fundamental distinction between the two. Uh, empathy is feeling what another living thing feels. Uh, compassion is putting yourself in the shoes of another person, seeing the world through their lens and perspective uh, for the sake of classically defined alleviating their suffering. Within a work environment, I don't think you have to go as far as suffering. It can be to help them achieve an objective. Definitely not at LinkedIn. Yeah, ho hopefully not a lot of suffering at LinkedIn. And he, uh, he paints the, this very vivid picture uh, to help people understand uh, the fundamental difference, which is if you were walking along a mountainous trail and you were to come along uh, an individual who was being crushed by a boulder on their chest, the empathetic response would be to feel the same sense of crushing suffocation, thus rendering you helpless. You wouldn't be able to do anything about it if you're experiencing that same kind of pain. The compassionate response is to maintain enough distance between you and the other person where you can recognize their suffering and then elect to do something about it to recognize that they can't breathe, to recognize that they're in pain, and then do everything within your power to get the boulder off of their chest. So that's, that's how I was introduced to the concept. And so, and at the point that you were introduced to the concept, was that before you, that was before you got to LinkedIn? It was before I got to LinkedIn. I, I read that book when I was about 30 years old, and uh, true story, uh, my wife can attest to it, she's in the audience here today. Uh, that book remains on my nightstand to this day. Uh, I've only read it once cover to cover, but just seeing it there uh, brings me back to that moment where I kind of learned and experienced a lot of those principles. And how did you bring those principles with you to your professional life at that point? Uh, I didn't. So I was not someone uh, I would have characterized as a compassionate manager or leader. Uh, while I was at Yahoo, I was very fortunate to have been given a fair amount of responsibility, especially for someone with such a limited operating background. I had started in the corporate development group and then I moved into operations. And uh, it was interesting, you know, I think like a lot of less experienced managers, I expected the people on my team to do things the way that I did, which is very human, by the way. You know, we're all egocentric. We all see the world through our own lens. Uh, egocentric shouldn't be confused with egomaniacal. Uh, there's a big difference between the two, and it's very a human. Very important. Very, difference. very important difference between yeah. the two. And to see the world through your own lens actually, to a large extent, keeps us safe. We draw upon our own perspectives and experiences, and uh, it's, it's fundamental to human nature. In a managerial capacity, it also would be very natural to assume you've been given more responsibility. You're a manager now. You're responsible for a team. So why not draw upon your own experiences and what works, your best practices, to assume that your team should be doing things the same way that you do? Right. That's not how to get the most out of people. As a matter of fact, it can create a tremendous amount of tension and frustration, friction. How you get the most out of the people that you work with is by understanding who they are, what they want, what they're trying to accomplish, their dreams, their hopes, their fears, their insecurities, their frailties, and playing to their strength, and not trying to force fit them into what you do well, but coaching them on the things that they can be doing better and really setting them up to be successful to the best of your ability. When you can do that and you build a team around that kind of ethos and potentially build even a company around that ethos, uh, you can do some pretty special things. So what was your process? I mean, you know, the first time that I wrote a substantial story about you was right when you got to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. It was at Fortune Magazine. That was, what, 2009? 2009 uh, yeah. is when we met, yeah. Um, uh, you have changed a lot as a leader mm -hmm. in that time. So walk, walk me through, were there any sort of pivotal moments that led to that change? Uh, a number of those pivotal moments actually happened before I joined LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Being in the, the position of CEO allowed me to start to practice the things that I had observed, things where I thought it would be best to, to not replicate, uh, not necessarily things that I had necessarily done, but things I had 
watched others do, and then through my own experiences, uh, tried to implement and manifest things that I, I hope to or aspire to. Uh, managing compassionately would be a great example. Uh, I remember uh, one uh, incident in particular. I was working for somebody who was growing increasingly frustrated with a member of his team and would express frustration uh, to that person in front of the rest of the team at staff meetings. And uh, my colleague, who was on the receiving end of that, was actually getting the job done. He just wasn't doing it to the extent our boss wanted it done. And so he would make snide remarks from time to time, and, and he would make a joke at his expense. And eventually, it, was, it wasn't good for anyone. It wasn't good for the morale of the team. It certainly wasn't good for my colleague. And it was undermining, he may not have realized, it was undermining the manager. And so at one particular one-on-one, -on -one, I pulled him aside, and I said, I just want to be honest with you and be candid with you. The next time you feel like expressing yourself in that way and expressing that frustration, you should go find a mirror and do it to yourself because you're the reason a person's in the role. And you should be recognizing how they do their job and playing to their strengths. And if for whatever reason it's not going to work in this particular role, you can find other opportunities for them within the company because they're really talented. And if for whatever reason that doesn't work out, you can potentially transition them to another opportunity outside the company. And as I was saying this, I realized I was doing the exact same thing to someone on my team. I mean, the exact same thing. And in that moment, I literally aspired that for as long as I was going to be responsible for managing other people, I would aspire to manage compassionately. And I say aspire because it's really, really hard. So to the, to the idea that it's really hard, you have some personal practices. That, I mean, you're, you're, you practice mindfulness. Um, can you talk a little bit about the structure that you set up so that you can succeed at that? Well, to your point, uh, mindfulness becomes foundational. And regardless of whether one has a, a meditation practice or just tries to live in the moment, it's absolutely critical that you're mindful, that you become a spectator to your own thoughts, especially when you become emotional in those moments of tension, in those moments of conflict. And everyone here has conflict with the people that you work with because you're a human being. And I have those conflicts, too. And if you're going to be in that moment, and like a lot of folks, take an egocentric approach to that, anytime someone disagrees with you, anytime there's that conflict, anytime there's that friction, more likely than not, you're going to assume nefarious intention on the part of the other person. They're being political. They're being territorial. They're ignorant. They couldn't possibly understand where you're coming from. Otherwise, how could they disagree? And in those moments, that's when it becomes just essential to become a spectator, to understand that you're being potentially triggered, what you're right. being triggered by, what that other person may have gone through or what they're going through. And so in that moment, you can try to forge a stronger connection by virtue of understanding their perspective. Right. You know, it's impossible to talk about your management strategy without taking a step back and understanding the unique thing that is LinkedIn. Hmm. Um, and I wonder if you can articulate what the vision for it is, and trick question here, how it's changed. So uh, in terms of our mission, in terms of our vision, our culture, our values, uh, we took the time to really get that right and codify that shortly after I joined. It'll be 10 years in December. And uh, those pillars of our plan have remained uh, entirely unchanged over the last decade. Our strategy has changed. Our strategic objectives have changed. Our core value propositions have changed. Our target audience has evolved over time. But those four pillars. Uh, have remained unchanged, and I think that's part of why we've had the success that we've had thus far to date. But with regard to our vision, and, and taking a step back, we draw a distinction between vision and mission in a really clear way. Uh, mission is an overarching objective uh, for everyone within our organization that is measurable, realizable, and hopefully inspirational, to Jonathan's point earlier in the importance of inspiration. The vision is the dream. That's true north. And when we originally developed the vision, it wasn't supposed to be measured. It was just supposed to inspire and guide us. And our, our mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. And by some estimates, there's roughly 760 million to 780 million knowledge workers or professionals in the world. And we've signed up roughly 600 million. So several years ago, when we started to recognize that uh, we were on a path uh, to connecting a good chunk of that addressable, op addressable opportunity, and you know, there's certainly plenty of work to be done in terms of making them more productive and successful. Uh, we started to ask what would come next, and the answer was our vision. Our dream was to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. 
There's north of three billion people in the global workforce. So we set about developing a strategy and a roadmap to make that happen. And that was roughly five, six years ago. And I'd never been in a company that had used their vision uh, in an operationalizable way. It, was, it wasn't the design for the vision. Uh, but sure enough, we developed uh, a roadmap and a blueprint for what we call the economic graph. LinkedIn had been founded by Reid Hoffman, who has been on the stage on multiple occasions and has uh, won an award uh, from the organization. Uh, but Reid and, and his co-founders, uh, in essence, uh, developed and created a professional graph. Uh, it was a digital mapping of professional relationships between people and how those relationships and connections could unlock value for all the members of that network. The economic graph digitally maps the global economy, and it does so across six dimensions. So the first dimension is every member of the global workforce, all three billion plus people. We'd like for there ultimately to be a profile on LinkedIn for all three billion plus members of the global workforce. Uh, the second pillar is to have a profile for every company in the world. And depending on who you talk to, there's north of 60 or 70 million companies when you include small, medium-sized businesses. The third pillar is for there to be a digital representation of every digitally accessible job availability in the world. And there's roughly 20 million or so of those jobs available at any given time. Uh, the fourth dimension is to provide access to the skills. Originally, it was standardized data. And over time, we acquired a company called Linda to provide the coursework necessary to acquire the skills to get the jobs offered by those companies. And the fifth dimension is for there to be a presence for every higher educational organization, junior college, vocational training facility that facilitates the ability for our members to acquire the skills to get their jobs offered by that, those companies. And then lastly, uh, the sixth pillar is a publishing platform uh, to enable every individual, every company, every university to share their professionally relevant knowledge if they're interested in doing so. And then when those six pillars are in place and we've achieved critical mass and scale, we can allow for intellectual capital, working capital, and human capital to flow to where it can best be leveraged. And in doing so, we can help lift and transform the global economy. Which is actually just a very complicated way of saying something we heard earlier, which is make people better. Yeah, so uh, at heart, uh, when we talk about our core value proposition, we talk about connecting our members, connecting our customers to opportunity. But you can actually go a, a level deeper than that and go back to the original founding vision and the original founding value prop, which was within a professional context to help and be helped. And when you can help others and when you are in a position where you can leverage your relationships and your network to advance your career, uh, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful dynamic. You know, and I think what is interesting about that in this moment is that what it comes back to is purpose, and that as a manager, you have found a way, uh, and I say this as a reporter who's reported on you for years, of keeping a sense of purpose for everybody on your team mm -hmm. front of mind. Yeah. I, and your I, team I keeps getting much bigger. So yeah, how the yeah. heck do you do that? Uh, so it, it starts with codifying the sense of purpose. It, it starts, I mean, taking a step back even further, defining your sense of purpose, defining the what, defining the core, defining what your company is all about, defining the value that you're going to create for others, and then taking the time to codify it. We created a, a template uh, or a framework that we call From Vision to Values, uh, which documents and codifies all those components I described earlier, and repetition. Uh, David Gergen, uh, a communications master, worked in four different White House, White House administrations for both uh, Republicans and Democrats, which gives you an indication of how talented he is, uh, <laughs> that both sides would want to hire him. Uh, he said something to the effect, and, and he served under Ronald Reagan, uh, who was uh, very effective in terms of mass communication. Uh, he said something to the effect of, if you want to get a message across, especially to a large audience, you have to repeat yourself. And you have to repeat yourself so often that you get sick of hearing yourself say it, and only then will people begin to internalize it, which is very counterintuitive. If you ask most, most managers and most leaders about repetition, they'll tell you they don't want to go anywhere near it, because once they start to say something over and over again, they start to get bored. And they're just assuming their audience is bored as well. But it turns out your audience needs to hear it over and over and over again to cut through all the noise and to cut through all the clutter of their day-to-day -day experiences. And so when you take the time to define what you're about and what you want to accomplish, and not just the what, but also the how. We haven't talked as much about culture and values yet, but that's become our ultimate competitive advantage at, at LinkedIn. 
And when you take the time to define the what and you define the how, and then you repeat it, and then you practice it, you can't just talk about it. You can't just paint it up on the walls or print out those laminated cards for people to stick in their wallets. You have to walk the walk on this stuff every day, starting with your leadership. And then it has to be reinforced in terms of your hiring practices and the people you bring into the organization, your onboarding practices, your learning and development practices. And at LinkedIn, we even established it as part of our performance evaluations because it's not just about the results that you get at the company, it's how you get those results. So Jeff, here we are, and here is your audience, and here are your final few seconds. What is that message that you want to repeat one more time so that people take it? Well, our vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And one of the things that I think is um, somewhat unique about our vision is it's a vision not just for our employees, right. and not just for our members and customers, but for all of us. That if we can all give some thought to how we can begin to create opportunities, not just for the people in our network, not just for the people that we went to school with, not just for the people that we used to work with, but everyone, people beyond our networks, to put ourselves in their shoes, I think we can all create a lot of value in the world. Thank you for that, Jeff. <laughs> I'm gonna let this